we are hanging in there by the grace of God is, is really the one way to put it. It's been a particularly trying time uh, teaching via Zoom. Um, you learn a lot. I am grateful that I have two teenagers who, who are teaching me how to navigate. I just heard one of them say, mom, don't forget to unmute yourself. It's the first, first thing that I have learned. So, um, but it's, it's, been, it's been challenging. Um, I am privileged to be enough because at Harvard Law School, I am designated as one of the essential personnel. So I do get to go into the office at least once a week uh, on Mondays uh, to, to, to spend time in the office and, and do uh, the, the clinic's business. Um, on a personal note, it's been very hard. On Sunday, um, I got a call about 9.30 um, that one of my very good friends and one of our deputies at the clinic at Harvard Law School, Christian Nunes, uh, died of a heart attack. Um, mm -hmm. She had just had a birthday. So it's been, uh, actually there's a vigil being held for her as, as we speak. Um, it's been a particularly disorienting week <laughs> up to now, but um, uh, I, I, I am grateful though that um, I got to know her as a, just a wonderful, remarkable person. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be here. It's been rough, but we've been keeping and coping by the grace of God. Mm. That's great. How about you, Jennifer? Um, yes, I just want to echo what Delia said. Thank you to Veritas for the lovely invitation. Um, it's really a privilege to be a part of this important conversation. Um, and we're hanging in there as well. Um, I guess the the most challenging part of the pandemic for me has been um, our incarcerated students in the Northwest Prison Education Program have been on complete lockdown since March. So they're spending 23 to 24 hours a day in their cells every day since uh, since March. So uh, we had to shift gears very quickly to offering um, only correspondence courses. Um, and as, as we all know, that, that just, that's a, you know, poses a lot of pedagogical challenges, um, but we're working through it and the students are some of the most courageous and remarkable people I've ever met. So, um, so we're doing the best we can. What, what have you learned about yourself in doing this time of pandemic and your, and your teaching, right? The, the lack of, I think that the lack of embodiment, right? Not being able to be physically together. I think it teaches us something that we could not have learned otherwise, right? I'm, and I'm curious to hear that as, as, thought, as thoughtful scholars and practitioners. Well, I have learned that I am not, that I'm actually, there's a creative side to me. <laughs> which I, you know, I, I, I thought, wow, okay. So I, um, I have also learned that I am, that I am not as jaded and dinosaurish as I thought I was, that I can actually figure out this Zoom thing um, and, and how to navigate some of the buttons and, and the, the lighting and all that. So that I am capable of learning new material is what I <laughs> chiefly discovered about myself. And that, um, you make of it um, you, that, you know, when you're given lemons, you should be able to make lemonade. Um, I, I can't really complain because we have the luxury of having laptops and computers and we are a very well resourced university. So I'm able to have a, a, a office at my home. So I really can complain. And so I, I'm learning uh, how to be, even be more grateful for the things that I used to take for granted before. Right. Um, I'm learning. Uh, I, it used to be that going from class to class, I will uh, say, oh, please don't let all, all of any, any students bother me. I'm going to the next class. And now as I walk through the empty halls, I'm like, Lord, what I wouldn't give <laughs> for a student to come up to me and say, hey, professor, how about this? Right. And so I, I, I am learning about myself that it, I, I'm so much I have a, a, a greater sense of gratitude now than I, I think I had six months ago, right? And, and that's a remarkable thing. Uh, I thought I was a, always a grateful and thankful person, but I, there's a, a deeper well that I have discovered. And, and now I'm just grateful when my internet doesn't break off. Uh, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm learning to rediscover what mm -hmm. it's like um, to navigate new spaces. And I'm just really grateful for that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. How about you, Jennifer? Um, yeah, I guess 
things I've learned, but um, the interpersonal daily connections are more important than I think I realized, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. I was, I've never been without them, but um, all the little spaces in between meetings and all the walking down the halls together mm -hmm. and um, the after meeting, you know, conversations and connections. And um, I think I've come to realize just how valuable all of those interpersonal connections are. And, um, you know, again, especially, I think, you know, some communities are hit far harder by their absence than others. Um, and, you know, just echoing what Delia said, you know, I am really grateful that, you know, we um, can have a, a, a format like this. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also poignantly aware of the fact that, you know, millions of incarcerated people, for instance, don't have access to the kinds of technology, I mean, um, that, that we're using right now. And for instance, can't be a part of a conversation mm -hmm. about racial justice um, when they, you know, should be the most, in many respects, the most centered voices in this conversation. So um, it's also made me quite powerfully aware of that. I mean, on a, on a positive note, since I don't want to always just be a downer about these things, um, the Mellon Foundation did just give us $100,000 to buy two-way video conferencing devices for the prisons in Illinois. So um, we just had two delivered on Monday to the women's prison that we are expanding um, to work in. So, you know, we're optimistic that, um, as is typical with the Department of corrections we got them installed and then they discovered they didn't have outlets in the classroom so, um, so we have to get outlets put into the classroom now but in any case you know we are hoping that um, we will be able to um, offer some of these opportunities within the prisons in Illinois yeah yeah so we we are still in New York we are still waiting to get permission to put our systems into our, our classrooms and yeah, it's been it's been rough. I, I never used Zoom until March of 2020. I have never ever used Zoom, and then all of a sudden I was spending 10 hours a day on on Zoom. So this is, and I don't think it's something I'll ever get used to, or something I want to get used to. I don't know. I don't know if it's a good thing. But let's uh, let's jump into our our conversation. As uh, as Jovan said, this is a conversation about uh, racial justice and. Uh, rather than focusing it on on just the conversation on racial justice uh, i thought we would we would talk about something that's uh, that's a common passion amongst the the three of us which is the criminal justice system and and beyond that to try to get even deeper rather than a conversation on just race and criminalization in america right as as a sociologist i want to build upon the work of one of the founders of my discipline w.e.b du bois in his seminal work, uh, The Souls of, uh, of Black Folks. He, he wrote this book, right, over almost 120 years ago. And he called it The Souls of Black Folks because that was, that was actually in question in those days, right? That, that black people were not fully human. And he wrote this book, this extremely personal and insightful book, you know, writing about the death of his, uh, his son. And, you know, this is before the age of the, the personal essay, right? He's pouring his heart out to make a case that uh, that black people are, are humans right and and as a sociologist as a scholar of, uh, of race I, I knew this intellectually but it, it didn't come alive to me it didn't hit me until until I started working at New York Theological Seminary where we have a, a master's degree that as things in correctional facilities and maximum security prison here we've had a master's degree there for the last uh, 38 years and the first class all the students have to take is something called foundation in ministry. And they have to have, it's a master's degree, so they have to have had a, a bachelor to come to us. So all our students are lifers and uh, all of them have been in there for, have been incarcerated for 10, 15, some 20 years. And they come to us and they take this class and the one question, the one paper they have to write for this class is, what is your purpose in this world? And they sit there with a professor and we give them readings. They have to tie their story with a larger narrative of, uh, of philosophical writings and sometimes, you know, scriptures, whatever is most pertinent to them. And they have to figure out what their, their purpose in the world is. And at the end of the semester, they have to read that paper to each other. And, and these are guys who don't know each other, right? They, they get transferred from different facilities to, into Sing Sing to do this for one year. And at, at the end of that class, when they're reading that paper, there, there, there are no dry eyes, right? It's, a, it's extremely emotional, powerful, and, 
and I've been told by more than one of our alumni that uh, that taking doing our master's degree, having an opportunity to write that paper was the, the most significant thing they've ever done and, and the, 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 the most significant gift they've ever been given, second to freedom, right? This, you know, a lifer told me, this is second to freedom. Being able to, after so many years of being dehumanized, you turn into a number, one of many, right? Sitting there and being told that they, they have a purpose, right? That you have a purpose and we want you to write about it. And then the second semester, the foundations of ministry too, they have to write, what are they going to do with their lives? So they've written projects, many of which are, are nonprofit organizations right now throughout New York and in other facilities. They're, they're actually running the, the programs. And so it's both of you uh, are, work with uh with individuals of course jennifer you you teach classes at a maximum security facility and delia you defend people who uh, who, who are in in the system uh, and and i'd like you to share with us with how wh whether you you see that and whether you see whether you see your role as uh, as somebody essentially fighting right for for the humanity of, of, of individuals to be seen in, in our society. Uh, Delia, we, we can start with you. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, so I thank you, thank you for, for the, the narrative and the framing that you just did with the work that you do. I was really struck by what you said um, in terms of uh, W.E.B. Du Bois' book, um, where you said, I think you said a long time ago, um, Blacks <laughs> were fighting to be seen. And I thought, no, it's, that's still us now. We are constantly fighting to be seen. It is the reason why I do this work. It is the driving factor. It's the, 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 the driver behind all that I do. You wake up every morning, you take a look, you're like, yep, I'm still Black, right? And you have to make decisions based on that. Mm -hmm. And you make decisions based on that, given my station in life, um, given everything else. You, you, you're given your position, your education, and it's still a struggle. It's still a daily uh, struggle as a Black person in this country. And then you get to my work. You get to the people uh, whom, from whom, for me, it is an honor and a privilege to defend daily. Um, and you see how marginalized they are, how dehumanized they are, whether it's a police officer who doesn't even think enough of a human being but to put their knee to, the, to their neck, right? And even when they're crying out and calling out, they pretend that that's not a human being, right? Or this idea that Black lives are so expendable and dispensable and to the point where um, as a Christian, you begin to question and wonder if we are all made in the image of God, how is it that certain demographic certain, uh, uh, subsets then encounter this? So people always say to me, what's your, what's your ethos when you represent people? And mine is to do the best I can for each person that I represent, a person at a time, if I can restore the humanity so by the time a client gets to me, for example, they've been arrested. Uh, most of them have the, the, the general population of folks I represent are mostly men, mostly mm -hmm. black men. Uh, you layer that with maybe some mental health issue, some addiction. Um, uh, you, 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 you juice up that, that, that with uh, this idea of classes, classism and racism and inequities that are already intentionally built into the system. And you just have a group of people that it just seems uh, just virtually constantly being maligned. Um, and so my work is one where every morning I wake up, I ask God, I want to be able to make a difference in restoring the humanity of the person I encounter. And so what does that look like practically? It just means being able to say good morning and pre-COVID shaking your hand, right? Because up to that point, everybody is not shaking your hand. Everybody is either put you in handcuffs or shepherded you through uh, whatever space you're in. 
um, it requires saying good morning, Mr. Jones, for example, where everybody up to that point has called you the N-word or called you a defendant or called you all sorts of name besides your name, right? Some clients actually, when they first meet me and I say good morning, they are taken aback and I call them by their proper name and I set out my hand and I shake their hand. In that moment, they look at me and they say, like, it's, you can see it quizzically all over their faces like, whoa, whoa, this is going to be different. This person is going to recognize my humanity. And so it is, the, the work I do is really based on this idea that, uh, you know, lived out in Proverbs 31, uh, verse 8 where it says, um, you know, to give voice to the voiceless, to provide to the poor and the needy, and to bring justice, to bring about justice for those who haven't had it. And I can tell you in the 22 years that I have represented indigent folks, it is hard, particularly if you're black, if you're a person of color, and if you're male, it is hard hard to get justice. I know because I can see the difference when I'm representing somebody who's not black versus somebody who is. The inequities are built in. It is tremendously unsettling to watch. Um, so I'm, I, I'm, I want uh, Jennifer to get in on this conversation, so I'm going to be quiet. But really, it is the reason I keep going because, because you can't really stop. You can't close your eyes mm -hmm. when you can when you see injustice every day, every second, every minute. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, thank you, Delia. Yeah. I, I mean, I really just kind of want to echo um, some of the points that um, Delia made. I mean, I think that dehumanization is at the core of the prison system in the United States. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure you you know many people on this call are aware of just how many people this country is locking up. And I mean, we're the global leader by a long shot. So, I mean, we're the home, you know, the United States is home to 5% of the world's population, but 25% of its incarcerated population. And we incarcerate almost 2.3 million people. And connecting this up with um, some of, of Delia's comments, you know, the Bureau of Justice reports that one in three young black American males is, is expected to go to jail or prison during his lifetime. I mean, one in three. And you know, black men account for roughly 6.5% of the United States population, but 40, over 40% of the prison population. So, you know, this is, an, you know, when we talk about the criminal legal system and we talk about incarceration, we're talking about um, an issue of racial injustice. I mean, that's that's you can't talk about those without um, connecting those issues. Um, and also just talking again about just dehumanization um, and some of the comments that Delia was making. Um, incarcerated Americans are also five times more likely than the general population to have a serious mental illness. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, kind of people who get, you know, sucked into the system um, and um, Two thirds of incarcerated Americans have a substance, you know, use disorder, and um, find their ways um, into, you know, the kinds of treatment that, you know, we were just hearing about, you know, handcuffs, leg cuffs, strip searches, restraints, cages, all of the ways in which we tell people who are incarcerated every single day um, that they're going to be um, treated not as, you know, kind of fully human. Um, you know, just some other, I think, things to just think about, you know, more than 60,000 Americans are in solitary confinement and solitary confinement has been shown over and over to drive people to the brink of insanity. Um, I mean, people who are in solitary experience delusions, they engage in, I mean, I have, I have a friend who was in solitary for 22 years and he engaged in desperate acts of self-mutilation. And when he talks about his years in solitary, he says it was the only way of getting human contact. He would, um, I mean, I'm not gonna go into details because I'd have to give a content warning, but I mean, he would cut himself in ways that, you know, um, really were just uh, unimaginable. And he would do it because people would rush to the cell. I mean, the first time he saw someone one um, engaged in self-mutilation. He was just shocked by the compassion and that he was treated as someone, that person was treated as someone who mattered. Um, and so these are the ways, you know, in which I think, these are just some of the ways in which, I mean, the list can go on and on. I mean, voter disenfranchisement, you know, only, only two states in the nation allow people who are incarcerated to vote. So they are literally shut out out of the democratic process. Literally, they are denied a voice in the democratic process. And yet, elected officials um, 
you know, um, the, I mean, the U.S. Census Bureau still counts incarcerated persons as residents of the location of the prisons rather than their home communities. And so this shifts, you know, representation in Congress away from the towns and cities and communities that need, you know, the jobs and shifts them over to the very communities that make mass incarceration possible. So anyway, these are just some of the ways. Um, I don't want to talk for too long, but so in with with all your experience do you have any insights for us on, on, on where when at what point does the, this dehumanization process happen right because for for both of you by the time they they are arrested by the time we see them in, incarcerated they've experienced this type of you know dehumanization for a long time especially if they're you know people of color and especially if they're black right and and then based on your experience, what, what does the, the rehumanization process look like, right? What, what do you do to, to both give the, the individuals, right, the, that, that sense of um, that, that they are human, but then for all those around the system, I know it's, it's a huge uh, task to, to change the cultural norm, right? But, but what, what do you, what, yeah, what are your insights about about rehumanizing the, our, our you know, brothers and sisters, the, our 2 point plus million brothers and sisters behind bars. Either, either one of you can, can go. Delia, do you wanna go first? You're muted. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Jennifer, you can go, you can go, sorry. Okay. Um, so um, I will, um, I'm sure Delia will have um, a different set of experiences to draw on. So I'm going to, I'll focus on, I mean, since so many people um, listening tonight are in universities, come from educational backgrounds, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, um, I think, humanizing power of education. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of conversations now around prison abolition and abolishing or defunding the police. And, you know, a lot of those conversations are focusing on this country's, you know, pernicious investment in institutions that led to mass incarceration, right? Um, a pernicious investment in over-criminalization and over-policing. And, um, you know, that's where we have invested, you know, as a country, that those are the institutions we've invested in and we have failed to invest in the kinds of, of um, structures that would, you know, kind of prevent communities and prevent community members from ending up, you know, kind of with substance abuse problems and, you know, kind of um, treating mental, you know, kind of health issues, you know, before they get sucked into the criminal legal system. So one of the ways I think in which we can, um, you know, humanize, especially as, as educators and be involved in this, um, is to reinvest in education in all sorts of ways. So think about your communities, think about your institutions. I mean, one of the ways in which, of course, I, I focus, you know, my efforts here at Northwestern are specifically on prison education. And I'll just make a couple of remarks about the importance of prison education in particular, just because that's, you know, one of the areas that I come from. So, you know, the federal crime bill in 1994, one of the many disastrous impacts of the federal crime bill, you know, you know, that's one of the main causes of the mass incarceration as we know it. But one of them is they denied Pell Grants to people who are incarcerated. And so, you know, you know, when that federal crime bill was passed, um, the result was absolutely devastating. There were over 350 prisons that offered post-secondary educational opportunities in the early 1990s. And a decade later, that number had dropped to 12. And so one of the things that as, as you know, members of universities and colleges, you know, we can kind of, you know, sort of take up the call to fill that gap, right? I mean, and to provide the educational opportunities that I think are so um, humanizing to people. So, I mean, I can, there's, there's lots of stories I could share about the humanizing power of the classroom. I'll talk, tell one very briefly, so I don't eat up that much time. Um, but there's empirical work that shows that um, prison education environments break down a lot of the racial tension that exists in prisons. And you know, just anecdotally, you know, in my own classroom, um, at the start of a term, I had um, a couple of students in the class who were known leaders of white supremacist gangs about a decade ago. And you know, I think you know, probably 85, 90% of my students were students of color. And you know, a couple of years ago, the possibility of you know, kind of discussing or debating 
debating ethical issues in a classroom would have been inconceivable. Um, but I think that through kind of, um, you know, being members of the same like Northwestern community and like reading together and sharing ideas, it's really impossible to deny someone's humanity when you're debating like the morality of, you know, the death penalty with them, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that is in a way distinctively human. And so I think that's one of the ways in which we can um, think about, mm -hmm. you know, your question was how to humanize when we're in these dehumanizing uh, contexts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the 94 uh, crime bill, I, I think, I don't think many people know how, how brutal and cruel that was. I, we have students who, who, were, who were in classes in 94, and it's not just that they stopped funding it. They said they, their, their classroom were empty one day to the next. They came and took the books, right? They, whoever had classroom books in their cell, they came and took those. And, and it was devastating. They said, that the, they told me, they, they, were, they were there. They were in the middle of their classes. And it, it, the, the morale in the entire prison is, is just plummeted. It, it's, yeah, it is, the cruelty of it was, yeah, it, it's it uh, to me it's unimaginable. Uh, Delia. Yeah, so th that was just so powerful, um, um, Jennifer. But for me, wh when I think of what it means to uh, rehumanize someone, I really, uh, I think I get very depressed and less uh, optimistic when I think about it systemically. Mm -hmm. And so um, my students will tell you that I, t I, I say I my mantra is always focus on the person, right? Focus on what you can do as individuals to humanize another individual. And it really starts with the most basic thing, having empathy and not being complicit when you see injustice happening, right? Part of, part of the power structure that Jennifer talks about and even the power in education is that often we are very complicit when we see that which ought not to be and people are mm -hmm. quiet and when you're quiet guess what happens injustices continue to proliferate because that's exactly what happens uh, in our complicity i wanted to actually share um this this audio it's about um 30 seconds long mm -hmm. and i i, I want i, I want to preface it by saying it's a little it's about it's a, a public uh, um hearing where this particular client uh, was being denied bail on a charge. He was a, a passenger in a car and uh, he was being denied bail. He's 19 years old. Uh, the car was pulled over. There were four people in it. A gun was recovered, not on him, nowhere near him. But the government was asking for a very high bail, which his mother couldn't pay. And now, um, he, and he was a sole caretaker of his very disabled mom. And this is exactly what happened. So I share that with you because that is what, if you're not listening, if you have no empathy, if you're not paying attention, that's what courts in America look like every single day. Those are the people that I represent. That's a mom who's disabled, whose 19 year old kid was taken away from her and nobody thought about the collateral consequences of doing so, right? So he's taken away from her. She is not able to take care of herself. She's disabled. She has nobody to bring her a medicine to do the simple chores. The case ends up getting dismissed. And yet this man has spent three months behind bars. And we don't think of what that means, not only for him, but for his mother, right? And I know fully well that if that young man could afford uh, uh, was white, for example, or had money, for example, to post the very high bail that the government had asked for at about $10,000, he wouldn't have to go through that ordeal. And so the question about how you rehumanize someone is to just really care. 
just care. Uh, I'm hopeful that those on this call, young people on this call, um, unlike others, that you will actually care about your fellow human being, that you will have empathy and compassion as the Bible tells us that we must, and that we will see, right? What was interesting about this particular call where there, there were several people that I talked to afterwards, and I'm like, did you hear that mother crying? And many people in that courtroom said no. And that was really troubling. And I thought about it for a, a quick second and I realized that I'd seen it become so normal in our courtrooms that people had tuned out, people had become numb and indifferent, and that is a problem. And so the, mm -hmm. the most straightforward way to humanize is to care, to listen, to begin to ask the questions, what are we doing with the humanity of other of individuals that we find in the criminal justice system. I am just asking people to care. Just, just literally care about those who don't look like you, who don't have the same privileges that you have, and ask questions. Why is the system broken? Why do we have two separate systems for different demographic? Why is that happening? Just be curious about your own community and ask yourselves, how are you policing others? You know, I, I think that's a question that we don't ask ourselves enough. How are you policing others? How do you act when you go into a store and you see a, a, a young black man walking towards you, for example? What's your reaction? Do you think of them as human or do you think of them as other? And if you're asking yourselves those questions, I think it will get you to the point where you have to say, that person is a human being created in the image of God, and maybe I need to start treating them as such, and maybe I also need to start demanding that others treat them as such, even if they are accused of a crime. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you for playing that. And, and I hope the, the 176 people who are watching this, right, that uh, there, there, there's, a, there's not an imperative right, on, on us to not just come and see, but go and tell, right? Th this is what's happening. The, the 2 point plus million people in, in prisons in America, the great majority of them have never been convicted, right? They, they just took a case, pleaded a case, 90 some percent, right? 95%, I think, are, are, have never been actually been convicted. They just pleaded and now there's- Yeah, 93%, yeah. 93, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's not justice, right? This is not justice. And, uh, and so I, I want to piggyback on, 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 as we address the students, right? Both of you are in a very unique position in that you are, you are scholars, professors, but you also are, are fully invested outside of academia, right? And, and I, like, I, I like to hear how, how the logic was uh, how, what, what were you thinking or what, what was the decision process like? Because it is very hard, right? It's, it's very hard just to be in, in either one of those, just to be in academia and just to be a, a, a public defender or run a education pr pr uh, program in, in prison. But you are choosing to do both. So share with us a little bit about the logic of how, how you arrive at this place and uh, yeah, how, how you how how you, you you live that that bridge, right? That that hybrid of of a scholar and um, yeah, uh, in a world that in many ways is more real than than academia. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to start? Sure, I'm happy to go first. Um, so I think one of the um, we're um, here at Northwestern. We're doing um, we're doing a one book one Northwestern. Choice. And I'm the faculty chair this year and the book we're doing is Just Mercy. So we're inviting Brian Stevenson to campus. And one of the things I'm always struck by um, when Brian Stevenson is talking is when he talks about how we have this imperative, there's this imperative to be proximate to injustice and to suffering. And, you know, in his book early on, his grandma tells him, you know, Brian, you, you can't really know about something unless you, you look at it from close up. You can't really know about most things from, from, from far away. And I think that um, I, I think that we all are better scholars and better with academic research when we're up close, mm -hmm. when we're fully immersed. So, you know, much of my career has been 
spent working in an area of philosophy called epistemology. And um, my first book was on testimony. So, you know, the testimony that we hear from other people. And here I am, you know, two decades later, um, still working on testimony. But much of the work I do now is on um, coerced testimony and false confessions or a manipulated and extracted testimony uh, from eyewitnesses. Um, and um, I think that my work um, is, has been, and, and I can tell you about almost every single research project, I can point to a particular human being whose story motivated me to write that project, right? Mm -hmm. I had a student who um, was brought to the police station to, to view a lineup at 15 years old by his father, thinking he was just looking at suspects and was immediately separated from his father, interrogated alone by white, uh, five white police officers and confessed to murdering an elderly woman. And here he is in his 30s, um, still incarcerated. Um, and, you know, I, mean, I, I can tell story after story about every single sort of research project I, I've taken on in recent years. And so I think that really listening to Stevenson's call to be proximate, to be up close, um, is something that I think many, many of us in the university and many of us engaging in academic research and scholarship um, can, can really, you know, sort of take yeah. up that, that charge. And I find that um, I'm a, a better teacher and a better researcher because of my work in the prison and because of being up close to issues um, that really matter for the research I do. Um, and I find that I'm, I'm, I look at the prison system and the prison industrial complex more, I think, carefully because of my academic research, right? Um, and so I think that there's, there's a real synergy between those. I don't see these as two sort of separate parts of my life. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think that, that, that they really do uh, both kind of enhance, enhance both, the, both aspects. How, how did you end up directing the program, though? How did you? Well, because I founded it. I mean, so there just there wasn't there that's, wasn't that's a... one way to do it. Right, exactly. I founded and, and, it, and I'm directing it. That's right. yeah, so, so that's how um, we're. I mean, I am I am really proud to say we're the only program in the state of Illinois that provides a full degree granting liberal arts education. So um, that's remarkable. You know, um, but but that's how I ended up directing it. Mm -hmm. No, I, I echo everything that Jennifer said, um, that the intersectionality of my practice and, and my scholarly work and teaching, um, I think I got really frustrated with this idea um, of watching in practice really awful lawyers, just, just lawyers who didn't care, lawyers who were indifferent, lawyers who were particularly um, jaded and really shouldn't be in this line of work. And so I thought to myself, you know, I love practice. I love representing people. It keeps me sane. It, it makes me recognize my own humanity. It allows me to understand the grace of God and the mercy of God in my life. And, mm -hmm. and so part of what I do now is I, I have the best of both worlds, right? I get to train uh, third year Harvard Law School students to become client-centered, zealous advocates who have empathy and who at least are able to showcase uh, skill sets that are that are outstanding. And so I just, I love, I feel like I, I, I'm so blessed to be able to not only um, uh, teach, but also practice. It, it, I, I think about it and I'm like, truly it's the best of both worlds. I will, can you imagine, I would be bored otherwise if all I did was teach. I, uh, I would be bored out of my mind. There's something about really seeing the teaching come to life in court and, and, and make, knowing that you're making a difference not only in, uh, in the classroom, but also in the, the, the courtroom. I, it's, it's been one of the best things that's ever happened, finding this, this sweet spot, this hybrid, uh, that has that has really blossomed into something wonderful. Um, mm. I think the minute I stop loving it, I will walk away. But for now, it is it is just it's the best of both worlds. It's the reason I still have students ten years after they've graduated saying, you know what, I was in court today and I was in this trial and I remembered something that you taught me and I and I say to myself, how will Professor Muna do it? And I do it that way, you know. So th there's just something about that that's just really refreshing. Um, and, and I feel blessed to be able to, to do, to straddle, uh, actually to fully be immersed in both worlds, to be honest with you. Yeah. 
I think just hearing both of you now, it's, you, you're both uh, such an inspiration and I can see a lot of the younger uh, undergrad students and even grad students who are watching this are inspired by you and see you as, as models, that uh, role models that they would like to follow. What, what would you want to tell them? How, what advice do you have for the 19, 20, 21 year old who, who's watching now, who, who wants to, 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 to have this passion and, and learn how to be proximate to the, to the suffering and injustice that, that, that's around us? I will say live your life intentionally. Live it on mm. purpose. Uh, wake up every morning with, 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 um, with a zeal and a desire to make a difference. That's what I will say. Um, one of my, <laughs> long story, but one of my nicknames is Iron Pants because this friend that I talked about earlier who passed on will say to me, you're very strong and resilient. And when you go into court, you fight for someone else, like your life depending on it. Um, and then in my office, one of my students gave me this sign that says, wake up, kick ass, rains, repeat, right? And so every morning I wake up, I feel like, am I ready to go out there and by the grace of God, kick some ass? And the answer to that mm -hmm. question is always yes, right? So live your life intentionally. Find something that you're passionate about. But more importantly, make a difference. Um, it can't be all about you. It can't be about like, you know, let me get my education. Let me, that's mm -hmm. all great. But at the end of the day, when you look back on the tapestry of your life, are you able to say, I made a difference. I improved that person's life. One of my many joys is when I, I go to graduations of high school graduation of, a, of a, 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 a kid I got when they were nine years old, right? Back in Massachusetts, before the laws were changed in 2017, you could prosecute a nine-year-old who maybe had a tantrum and threw a book at a teacher and you could charge that child with assault with a dangerous weapon. And that child could be labeled as, you know, non-functioning, uh, uh, um, um, miscreant and delinquent. And all that child needed was someone, an attorney, a mom like me to say, I believe in you. What can we do? What resources can we bring to help you become the person that I know God has intended for you to become. And then seven years later, there I am being invited to high school graduation and watching this kid walk across and wave. And I'm sitting there as the lawyer next to the parents, right? Nothing, absolutely nothing means more than being able to make a difference in someone's life that way. Or if, you know, having a, cl a client who at age 19 years old, is driving his car, has a job at Lowe's, and, and, and gets his first paycheck and hangs out with other kids and you know, gets arrested for drunk driving. And he feels as an immigrant, his whole life is over. His whole life. And for two years, we fight. We fight, we fight so that he doesn't have a record. We do all we can so that he doesn't have a record and so that he can graduate with two degrees, right? two degrees and then give back to the immigrant community. So that's mm -hmm. what I would, I would say to anybody listening, live your life intentionally. The minute you wake up and you're not passionate about a thing, oh, come, let's have a conversation. Maybe I can give you some of this passion. But seriously, live your life on purpose. Make yeah. it count so that when you do leave, people are going to say, wow, that person, their life meant something. They're going to be missed because their life added value to others. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Jennifer? Well, that, that was powerful and it's hard to follow. I think that uh, my answer is gonna be maybe like maybe more um, mundane. So the first thing I would say is vote. Um, so if we're having a conversation about racial justice, the stakes are, are as high as they can be. So to all of the young people, like make sure you vote. Um, and you know, figure out which states it would be most effective. That's number one. Yes. Uh, um, the second is um, is to just get involved. I think that one thing that um, I mean, Delia's answer was 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 really powerful, and I think that it's a message that we can all kind of take just just take up take on. And I think I just want to add to her um, her suggestion that I think 
I, I, in my in my work um, here at Northwestern, I meet a lot of people whose research seems, or their their discipline seems, really disconnected from issues of racial justice. And I think that they feel as though there's just this kind of, you know, real like kind of, um, you know, that there's, there's, there's this side of things where people can kind of be involved and there's this side of thing where like, I just made some life decisions and my natural, you know, interest took me on this path and there's really no, nothing for me to do on these issues. And I wanna say there's in every, you know, kind of in every city there are, you know, tremendous grassroots organizations doing incredibly powerful, important work that you can get involved in, no matter what your background is. So I'll just put a little bit of a, like a, like a plug in for, um, if you go to our website, the Northwestern Prison Education Program, um, I think it's under Get Involved, we have a whole racial justice resource guide that I can't take credit for, like tons of people in my community helped put this together. Prisoners' rights active um, lawyers and activists and sociologists and historians, we, you know, it's a, it's a very comprehensive guide. And it gives you all sorts of ways in which you can get involved from small to big in you know, issues of racial justice. And if you're in, it's, it's, it's not all Illinois centered, but much of it is Illinois centered. If you're in a state, you know, where there's, you don't have a resource like that, put one together. You know, at, find a website at your university and link to it. Share these resources. There are so many ways of getting involved now um, mm -hmm. to sort of fight um, for racial justice. Um, and I think that um, I would just encourage everyone, no matter what, you know, you could be a physicist, you know, as I know, um, you know, Jovan is, you know, or you could, you could be do anything and you can still be part of the, um, of the movement. Yeah, and, and I think that that's key, right? Everybody can do something now, right? Number one vote, but also we can we can be fighting this now, and and it's a habit we have to cultivate, right? Because it's everywhere. This the the, the injustice and the racism is, it's in the the water we swim in, and we have to cultivate the the habit of of fighting up against it now. And so, so in closing, uh, we started talking about the hard times that we're living under, and both of you are doing extremely extremely hard work. That, that that can that can be you know emotionally psychologically debilitating sometimes right as a, as as a immigrant I'm, I'm from Argentina and I, I did a lot of work when I was in Charlottesville with with immigrant communities and and I was helping a lot of immigrants who were coming during the the great wave of immigrants of people who were separated from their children I was translating with them and and I thought I was just helping. But then by that fall, something, something broke in me, right? Because of, you know, I was sitting there listening to, to these women tell the stories of why they had to escape and, and making a case for asylum, right? And I was, I was sitting there listening and translating these, these stories. And, and it's, yeah, it, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot, right? And, and both of you are, are doing this work that, that doesn't have the happily ever after ending that, you know, movies have, right? It's, it, it, it's it's uh, it's monumental the, the the work that that, that you you are trying to achieve. So, how do you stay? Number one, self care, right? What do you do, right? What are your sources of motivations and 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 strength when when the the injustice is 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 trying to crush you? And and what advice do you have for for those of us who who are uh, at, at the margins of the the work that you are doing and trying to get get to the center of it, right? So uh, that's a that's a very loaded question because I this is this year for example has really highlighted um, amongst other things my inability or recognition that I have not been very good about self care right that mm -hmm. many times I hear myself say to myself you have to do a better job taking care of yourself and I know that I mm -hmm. feel woefully at it and I I. I I have to become better at it. So, so realistically, um, the work I do is hard. Uh, you, you heard that mom, for example, on that tape. Uh, mm -hmm. There are times that plays in my head, not her, not just her, others. Um, some of the things that the mm. the Commonwealth, the state, accuses our clients of are horrible things. Um, some of the conditions that my clients find themselves, some of the homes that I get to visit, some of the stuff that I 
my younger clients experience the abuse, emotional, mental, sexual, from people that they trust and love. Um, it's not just that they're experiencing it. I, as their representative, as their advocate, there's a secondary and tertiary trauma that you experience on a daily basis. And, and then the, the microaggressions that just happen for example, for someone like me, just being a black woman, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when I go into certain spaces, uh, particularly courts where they don't know me, and I come in in my suit, dressed as I ought to be dressed in court, and they say something like, "You must be the court interpreter," or uh, you know, who, uh, the social workers sit over here, and so the, the, it's it's constant and daily, and the trauma. Uh, is evident um, and can be debilitating sometimes. But I have learned two ways, actually m m more than that. I have learned the sense of really spending time in prayer, spending time in prayer, <laughs> right? If that makes sense. So quieting my spirit and asking the Lord every morning for strength, for grace, to face my day, uh, for wisdom and discernment to face my day, to figure out what it is uh, that, that he has called me to do within the day and asking for strength uh, uh, and the ability to, to, to do that. I've learned, um, like my, I have two teenagers. I'm, I'm a very, I feel very blessed to have my daughter, Ifani, who's 18, uh, 4th of July baby, and my son, uh, Edozi, who's uh, just one, on the New England debate uh, uh, conference, yay, and um, we'll be turning 17 on Veterans Day. So I'm a very patriotic American, 4th <laughs> of July and Veterans Day. I have learned to just enjoy them. If there's one thing that, I have, that has happened during this, this pandemic is just spending more time with them, laughing, really, mm -hmm. you know, getting to know them and enjoy them and spend time with them. And when some parents complain that their kids no longer talk to them, I'm like, Thank you, Lord, that mine don't stop talking to me, right? Um, I love that. I, I am grateful for that. I'm also learning in terms of self-care to be grateful for the little things, uh, the mm -hmm. flowers. Uh, you see the flowers behind me. I told you that's my love language. But to be grateful for, for the mundane um, uh, uh, things. And that's part of my self-care is just really, really learning to be grateful to, because I know that there are people who will look at my life with all the, the complaints and say, boy, I, I will trade places with you. And so I, I never want, I want always as part of my self-care to always have a sense of gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, at some point, I'm going to fit sleep in there. <laughs> it is a thing I struggle with quite a bit. And so any, to anyone listening, um, sleep, <laughs> try to sleep, take care of yourself, call your mom and dad. They want to hear from you. Uh, maintain human connections. We're very social people, so continue to maintain those connections. Um, uh, eat right, exercise if you can. But at the end of the day, you know, um, you want you want to make sure that that you that part of your self care is just getting yourself to be to a better place, if if that even makes sense. So uh, to always be better than you were the day before. So. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, my, that's, that's sort of my two cents on self-care. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you that I, I am, I don't want to use the word woefully failed at it, but I am, oh, that's what it, I'm a work in progress when it comes to self-care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's the immigrant mentality. As immigrants, we're always having to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jennifer, what, what advice and what do you, yeah, do you have any self-practice that you can share with us? I don't think I have any deep words of wisdom. Um, I mean, I think that what keeps me motivated um, mm -hmm. are, are, the people that, are the people in my life. Um, I mean, I think that what keeps me engaged in, in my work um, are the, the students and um, I, just echoing some of the things Delia said. I mean, some of the, the horrors and abuses and traumas that they have lived through um, are, are unimaginable. And um, I mean, during COVID, it was extremely, when it was, I mean, we still are living through this, but at the start, I mean, you know, I mean, almost immediately the National Guard was sent to the prison that I'm working at, you know, over 20 people died. Um, many of our students uh, tested positive. They lost best friends. They 
lost only family members. They had cellmates taken out, you know, gasping for their last breath and never came back. Um, one of our students works in the, in, the, in the health wing of the prison and, you know, literally himself found four bodies. He said, you know, four people who had died. Um, it, you know, it, the, the trauma is, is daily. It's every single day. Um, and trying to navigate how to be, to echo Delia, empathetic, how to be present, how to always um, be compassionate, how to advocate when you can. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'm on the phone. I mean, I was on the phone with the Illinois Department of Corrections today. I mean, there's just a traumatic experience for one of our students and trying to figure out how to navigate, you know, the advocacy and my precarious position because at any moment they can kick me out of the prison and I know that. Um, and so I don't have any deep, I mean, um, I, I, I love, I, I happen to live in um, a, a bit close, very, a place very close to Lake Michigan. And so I walk to the lake a fair bit and I take my dogs. I mean, so self-care, I mean, I like to run, um, but I think it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing lifelong challenge when you are engaged in work that is, that tears your heart out every single day. It's an ongoing um, dance, I think, to find out uh, to figure out how to um, remain fully present for the people in your life who are most traumatized and how to not fall apart yourself. Mm. Mm. That is so, yeah. so true, so true. So we'll take this time to um, select a couple of the questions that were in Slido. Um, so I'll start by um, giving the first um, question and Professor Muna and Professor Lackey, um, you can feel free to um, respond to whichever um, question uh, you'd like first. So the first question we have is, in a time of such division of the country, how do you propose talking with those who are more resistant to the changes that are being advocated at this time? I think it's, 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 it's a tough question. Um, so many conversations are so polarized. Um, but I do think that, um, one of the things I just tend to fall back on, and it's probably, I mean, at the end of the day, part of partly my training as an academic, um, but are the, the good arguments. I mean, at, you know, with so many of these issues, um, the research and the data make sense, and they show that we ought to be um, making changes in our society. So, for instance, let me just, I'll just give one example. I mean, I think that you know, there's a lot of conversation about like using really bold language like defunding the police or abolishing the police. And, you know, you have a lot of um, protests and, and, you know, kind of violence around some of these issues. And I think, um, I think that, you know, a, a comment that I've seen frequently made uh, um, is, is that like, look, this is not that radical of idea. You can just go to one of like the white suburbs near where you live. And that's what in, in many respects, police abolition looks like. That's where communities are investing far fewer dollars into policing their communities and far more dollars into the schools and into mental health resources and so on. And so I think that um, at least partly, I'm not saying that this is like, you know, kind of this, the, the end of the, the conversation, but I certainly think at least um, having the facts, you know, knowing what they are, um, presenting them, presenting them in ways that make sense and resonate with people. Like, I find that very vivid, like just find a, a you know, like, you know, here, like just, it looks like Will Max, do you know what I mean? That's what defunding the police looks like. Um, and I think that I have found um, that at least in some cases, you can make some progress um, through, through these kinds of, of um, you know, sort of argumentation and, and presenting, like, I think just compelling data. Well, I, honestly, there are, I think I think there are certain conversations that I just uh, am not even worth fighting for, right? Um, that that's just me. Uh, maybe other folks might disagree, uh, and and what I mean by that is so you know Jennifer is is powerfully articulated about presenting people with facts and and data, and and sometimes you can do all of that, and you are <laughs> you're, it's a it's an uphill climb, right? So. If you're having a conversation with somebody who starts off with the premise, for example, that Barack Obama wasn't born in America, there's not much you can do to con convince them otherwise. Like, like there's no foundation <laughs> on which to even have a cogent 
cohesive conversation. So people like that, you, I am happy to walk away if I've tried all that I can. Sometimes you got to let go. But what I have found uh, in terms of being persuasive is to actually have the person experience um, the, the communities that I work in, right? So if somebody keeps saying, well, uh, you know, how come they can't pull themselves up by the bootstraps? I'm like, well, why don't you come with me when we go visit X, for example? And I want you to see that they're working three jobs and they have to walk five miles to the bus. Let's, I want you to experience that. I'm not, I'm not saying you have to believe anything, but I just want you to see what their life is like. Um, when we have this program where you have prosecutors who actually, and judges who actually go to visit the cell block before, during their training, before they can sentence someone to jail, they themselves get to go experience that. They get to go visit the cell block. There's a program where the, the prosecutors will even stay in the cell block just to experience that. I'm telling you, when somebody experiences uh, the, the, the sort of thing that other, other individuals go through, that sometimes moves the needle. Um, but otherwise, I am willing to walk away from conversations where facts and science will not, will not persuade you. I, I, it's, it's good. There might be other people I'm able to convince, but I don't have to convince everyone. And that's okay, too. That's okay. So, so our audience is wondering how do we address the dehumanization of immigrant women by um, ICE as a racial justice issue? I mean, you just confront it, right? You, you do. Uh, the, there's a, I was just watching this gentleman and I'm blanking on his name because it's, a, it's sort of, I'm a little you know, exhausted, but, um, and he did a, a wonderful job documenting the experiences of immigrant children, right? Um, at the border, um, and it's a, it's a New York uh, a New York bestseller at the moment, um, and so you just you just name it for what it is. Uh, they 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 they, it is heartbreaking what some of these women have to go through. It is heart wrenching to watch, uh, and and the worst part is there was a report yesterday that uh, Jeff Sessions and 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 his ilk and those guys were intentional about separating mothers from their children, including babies as young as three months old. They said, we don't care, just separate mothers. That, the idea of separating a three month old from its mother, what that does to the mom, I can't even, it, it's so unjust, it's palpably evil. And yet that's the community that we live in. And so I will ask anybody who sees that to call it out. Call your Congress people, call your legislatures, let them know this is unjust, this is unfair. Protest, do, do those things right. Do all of the things that you can because that is not only unjust, but it's unconscionable. And we continue to do it because we, like I said, we've really just become indifferent. We, we, we literally just stand by and watch. And as long as that doesn't impact us, we, 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 let, we let it go. So the answer to that question is, don't be silent. Rise up and say something. Speak up. And I'll just pick up on, um, I think, a couple of things that Delia said and just um, highlight them. I mean, I think, um, well, one, I just would say, again, just vote, right? I mean, so um, I think with almost every question that's going to be asked tonight, the answer could be just vote um, and, and help other people vote and, and help get out the vote and, and canvas. Um, but then putting that aside, um, I want to just pick up on something that I think Delia has, has kind of highlighted and mentioned a few times. And I think that's just the importance of storytelling, too. I think there's a lot of people on this, you know, maybe there's some people on this call who, who are coming from a background of like, un, you know, as undergraduates, they write for the newspaper or they're journalists or they're thinking about doing this. And I think that one of the ways in which we humanize people is by allowing allowing them to tell their stories. Um, so one of the things I've really tried to do in my work is it's extremely difficult to get um, inside a maximum security prison with a camera. I mean, extremely difficult. Um, and I fought for about two years to get um, like 
some video camera from our university to, so that the students can tell their own stories, right? So that we're not speaking for them and so that we're not, I mean, I think the most powerful case to be made for prison education is to hear from the students. And I think the most powerful case that can be made about the humanization of immigrant women, for instance, is to hear from them. And so to the, whatever platform you have, and, and what's really fascinating is we all have strange platforms now, right? Facebook and Twitter and like, it's, it's really, I mean, Instagram and anyway, I, whatever else there is. Um, there's just so many people have platforms and to the extent that you can center the voices of the people most impacted and get the, their stories out there in their own voices, that will oftentimes humanize them because they are human and we've you know dehumanized them by false narratives. And so um, I do think that that is a power that we have now that we didn't have once before, the power of a platform. Um, the next question we have from the audience is this, can faith bring anything more to the idea of justice than a secular one? I think so. I think that faith um, uh, can, can bring you know, a different voice or an amplified voice uh, to this idea of justice. Um, I, I can tell you that I truly believe in this idea of what the Bible says in Micah 6, 8, right? Where it's, it, it really talks about uh, God hates injustice and will ultimately do all that he can to right every wrong. Um, I, I, I actually, let me see if I can read it. Um, it says, let me, sorry, let me see if I can actually find it and then read it. Micah 6, 8. Here we go. Uh, until the glorious day, God commands his people to act justly, love, mercy, and walk humbly with God and one another. Uh, and so th this, is, this is the mandate. Um, and so sometimes when we think of justice in the secular world, we just think of it as something that, that tracks the criminal justice system. Uh, but I believe that faith calls us to even a wider, broader uh, embrace of what justice looks like, right? Uh, and that, that, that we are called, we are mandated, quite frankly, to live a life of love and mercy and, uh, and forgiveness. And, and, and that we are called to be each other's brother's keeper, which is not a mandate that necessarily uh, folks in the circular world adhere to. And so for me, personally, faith is my guiding light in terms of what I think of when I think of justice. Um, that it, it, I, in Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 3, where the woman was crying out to the judge for justice and, and just kept bombarding and bombarding the judge and said, and this, the judge said, you know, this woman has been bombarding me and, and, and be, not because I care about her or because I care for, for, for the things that, she, that concern her, but because she's persistent, I will do the thing that she's asked of me. And so um, it, for me, faith requires that we be in, persistent uh, about our pursuit of justice for those who cannot do so on their own. And that's why I think it's, it's a little broader a mandate than than in the circular world. Yeah, so I think um, I think I would uh, agree with Delia that um, it's different. Uh, it's a different kind of mandate, but I think that it can be no less strong in the secular world. I think that the mandate can have a different grounding or a different source. So um, for someone who is um, doing this work um, because of one's faith uh, and it's grounded in one's faith. I think that um, that can be the source, I mean, of, of the strength that you get to go on, of the nature of the calling, of the particular works that, that ought to be done. But it can also be grounded in a general kind of framework of morality, right? Um, I mean, and so it can be a calling that we have as members of a moral community, for, for instance. Um, so I think that, you know, there are obligations that we have to one another just by virtue of being members of a shared moral community. And so I think that you can have a secular framework and a, a faith um, grounded framework that end up making identical in, in many respects demands of us especially in relation to racial justice, but that the explanation and the source of those demands would be explained differently. 
what, what are there any other steps that you would encourage us to take and, and how can we tackle improving the justice system at a more local level? So I think in, in addition to everything that's been said, um, and in fact, I, I really wanna echo uh, what Jennifer said about voting, um, please do vote. Uh, in fact, as Michelle, uh, Mrs. Michelle Obama encouraged us, vote as if your life depended on it because it, it quite frankly does. But in addition to that, I say I will say um, one of the things that I that I forgot to mention, but that I absolutely love doing is volunteering. Right, um, spending time with people, donating your time, donating your treasure, donating your talent. Uh, you have you make an impact. And so if you're if you're volunteering, for example, at a prison, at a soup kitchen, at uh, um, um, some place where you are coming in contact with other individuals who um, are being marginalized, who, for whom uh, ra racial and social injustices uh, are part and parcel of their daily lives. I think volunteering is, is such a powerful tool because what that enables us to do is, one, increase your sense of gratitude, but it gives you an appreciation for all the privileges that you have it also allows you to um, understand what the issues are, right? So when I volunteer at the soup kitchen, you don't have to tell me about food insecurity. I see it. <laughs> I see it when I volunteer. This. I learn so much just by volunteering two or three hours every Saturday at Rosie's Place, for example, or, 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 or at Pine Inn Street, for example, um, because I'm learning. I can, I, I am on the ground, I'm proximate to what, what's going on to suffer, to the suffering of people and I'm able to learn. It increases my empathy well. It um, allows me to have a perspective that I otherwise would maybe have to hear about on the news or have somebody retell that story. I have firsthand knowledge of what it means um, uh, to live uh, the life that other people uh, get to live. So. I will say, if you really want to be involved, do all the things that we've talked about, but, but volunteer. Uh, make this about something else uh, other, than, other than you. Again, use that platform that, you know, we, all, that we all have that's, you know, strangely, um, in this kind of new world, so to speak. Um, and to always, I think, to the extent that you can, lift up and center the voices of those most impacted. Um, and so um, find various ways of doing that in your own communities. And um, I mean, I think those are at least some of the ways to, um, that we could, and, and to vote. I'll just end with that, and to vote. <laughs>